Hey guys, Ben back again with KCD, home of the gun and gear reviews you can use. So one of the things I've been thinking about lately is just kind of going over some of the AR builds that I have. And it's interesting because a lot of times uh, right now people are getting into the guns that have never been into guns before. And I know that when I started looking at um, what was out there, the information to build guns or modify them or whatever, and it was a lot of, you know, it was a lot of like fuds on RFCOM and things like that, where they're like, hey, I changed my uh, my buffer weight, now my gun doesn't work, what do? Ch change it back? I don't know. Um, you know, and so there's a lot of stuff on there where I was looking at people with, you know, old DPMS, Model 1 sales, whatever, just these guns were just, you know, trash. And they didn't work. And they modified them over and over and over again and made them work less. Um, and there's nobody that was saying, hey, you know, this works, this is okay, this brand is good, um, things like that, at least without it turning into a huge skin and rulers game on the internet, because internet. So one of the things I was kind of kicking around is doing just a, a quick video about the builds and uh, kind of what the components are, why I chose them, um, where to get them, you know, hey, if they're something that I find that's ideal. Um, or something that maybe, uh, you know, I wish I did differently, perhaps. Um, and so one of the things that I was going to do is actually go over this gun right here. So I just got that QD off there. And so this is one of my more recent builds. And it is just a standard 5.56 carbine. Um, speaking of standards and stands, the stand here. It's a wonderful little unit made by Kane Arms that sent that over for review. Guys, thank you so much for that. This is wonderful for displaying these guns. Um, so anyways, kind of moving on. So what I did is I kind of built this in the middle of the coof, the panic, the pandemic, whatever you want to call it. Um, I know we're not supposed to say that on the internet, but, um, you know, and... In the middle of all this stuff, people are panic buying. I built several guns for friends and acquaintances, people that wanted them that never had a gun before, but all of a sudden they're like, wow, the National Guard's out, or wow, the, you know, the government is saying we can't take care of you, the police. Police are saying that, you know, we're not going to follow up on certain crimes. Um, you know, just that feeling of unease that you have during these times um, compounded by, you know, the fact that this was really affecting everybody and affecting them terribly so um long story short there's been a whole bunch of uh, building and stuff going on that um that i've done and uh yeah this is one of the results just kind of some pieces that i had together um that uh, i made uh, basically a gun out of um some of them I already had um but there's a couple that i ordered and uh it just gets taken care of so all told for this gun i mean 500 bucks something like that um, and again, a lot of the stuff was things I had before, um, but, uh, yeah, so it's been a pretty good, uh, build so far. And of course with everything, actually we are under a state of emergency and a lockdown right now, um, where they are ticketing for leaving the house and joyriding, um, without like a destination and things like that. So, um, we will be slipping to the range here before too long, but it's one of those things that, um, with having a new, a new child and everything in the middle of all this, uh, it's kind of been in the back burner to kind of, you know, sneak out with some, uh, some rifles and hit the range. But, uh, we will definitely be doing some videos of that once, uh, everything <laughs> gets back to normal or relatively normal. So what I'll do here is maybe, um, kind of do like the grand thumb thing and kind of go from tip to butt. Um, always seems to be exciting. I know I always smile when I hear it. Um, mostly tip, sometimes but, but anyways. So the first thing we're going to start off with here, the front there, this is a next level armament, a muzzle device and a muzzle brake. And as you can see, it kind of looks like, uh, one of the BCM mod zero comps, um, that's been cut differently instead of the just straight across. There's uh, a lot of you see there's like the slants on, on the cuts. Um, I don't know if that was a thing or not a thing or if anybody got mad about that or it was looking too close to it. Um, I don't see this on their website anymore, so maybe they decided to discontinue it for that reason or anything else. I don't know. Um, I can tell you that it is awesome and I love it. And 
it really, really makes the gun settle down. I mean, the yeah, I know 5.56 is not going to be a huge, you know, barn burner anyways, but um, as they say, you know, 5.56 rifles don't kick, they kind of jump, they twitch, and having it do less of that so your dot or your irons in this case can stay on target um, is something that I think is pretty good. So uh, underneath the hood, we have a Diamondback DB15 um, barrel, and that is a, let's see here, a one and seventh, I believe, twist. And uh, I got that from Primary Arms, um, uh, maybe about a month ago. And uh, they had a good sale on it, and it was like maybe 80 bucks, something like that. And this is a beater. This is not a gun that um, you ought to be squeezing super accurate groups out of, uh, you know, 500 yards. This is a go to the range and, and do some last. And um, it is also built to be an irons trainer. Um, I put optics on all of my guns, and this one I was just like, you know what? Um, we have a great, um, a great amount of space there between the the uh, the sights so great sight radius um you know this let's take advantage of this i've always wanted a dissipator unfortunately this is not quite a dissipator it's close but i'll still probably get one at some point just because i love the looks of it anyways so we'll see what the uh, diamondback barrel has for us there and then i think it's a standard like an expo arms uh low profile gas block nothing too expensive um and then uh, expo arms it's a mid-length um this is one of the first mid-length rifles I own. Typically, everything is carbine. Um, uh, maybe three hundred blackout with shorties. Uh, I think a pistol, and and things like that. But as far as a full-length rifle, this is the first time I've gone to uh, mid-length, and I'm I'm pretty excited to see how it shoots. I know it's a going to be a softer shot than uh, than most, but uh, yeah, we'll see how I like it. Um, so yeah, moving uh, back here, we'll go take a look at this here. This is the uh, primary arms weapon light. And go ahead and take a look at that there. And so it fits nice uh, right up there. And as far as weapon lights go, um, it is one of my absolute favorites for a lot of reasons. And I know the Surefire's cloud defensive, uh, whatever, you know, I get that. Those are really, really super nice lights. And I'm not, I'm not taking anything away from those. Um, but for the price and the durability um, of these lights, and I mean, definitely some uh, quite a bit of lumens out of there. Uh, I'm not sure if this is the 500 or 700 lumen model. I know that it looks like they probably discontinued those on Prairie Arms' website. But uh, yeah, I mean, I've, I've got like five of these, and they're all amazing. As a quick aside, two primary arms. Um, a couple years ago, I had one that failed. And they looked at my order and sent out one. And before I was able to send out the damaged one back, um, another customer service rep had sent out a second one. And, you know, so two of these lights showed up at my door. And they were so quick and so good with their service as far as getting me a, um, a new one of those products. It was one of those things where I called them up and I was like, hey, you guys gave me two lights. Um, you guys are always been solid. Where are we sending this back? And they were surprised. Um, you know, I don't know if people just go, hey, I'll just take these, but um, definitely not something that uh, that I'd earned there and uh, sent it right back to them. And everything that we've done since has been been awesome with them. So um, the light mount is a Viking Tactics light mount there. And just a little polymer mount. Um, there's been one on one of my guns for probably six to eight years, something like that. And they're great. Um, they are great for what they're for. You know, if there's uh, a side mount, I typically like to put the uh, the mag pole uh, light on there so you can kind of throw your thumb forward uh, on that grip there. But for something that's just going to mount right to the rail, um, it's phenomenal. You know, and it's it's easy to use, easy to work with. They have an insert in case you're going to use smaller lights. Uh, rock solid. I've run this thing through classes on my other guns. A, you know, night classes where you're banging stuff around and throwing your gun in the middle of the night. Right, that's not good. Um, but anyways, you know, you, where you're definitely using and abusing these, these lights and mounts. And, you know, just, just been absolutely solid. So if you're looking for uh, a good light mount that's not going to break the bank and so that's not going to be too heavy, definitely the Viking Tactics is a, uh, a good choice. So moving back there, we have a standard Embus. Um, you know, just, it's an Embus. Um, and I have
have a little Magpul ladder rail cover there just for, because that's where my hand's gonna be and that's where the gas block is right here. So I'd like to have something between my hand and all that. Um, but again, this is supposed to be an iron strainer. I was gonna go with fixed iron sights when I was doing the build. And the the cost was starting to spiral. I was, I was looking at you know six seven hundred dollars to do that with appropriate irons that I wanted. So um, just got some old embassies off uh, one of my other guns, and away we go again. I'd love fixed sights, but I'm a simple man. So all this stuff is riding on a Midwest Industries Gen Two SS rail. I think I said that right. Um, with the uh, proprietary, you know, rail attachments for things like the grips, things like the, uh, the little hand guard pad things, little hand stop. And you can see when you look at this thing, it's so close to being what Mo or MLOC would become. They just use the, you know, screw holes in there to mount devices and, and things like that. Um, so it's sort of an older, you know, it's almost like Latin, maybe a dead language, but, um, you know, it still works great, you know, and it's very, very lightweight. It's a 15 inch rail. Uh, the barrel nut is wonderful. The lockup, the securing system, the helicoils uh, is really, really nice. And I would be stupid not to put that on another gun. So um, I've had that for you know, six to eight years, something like that. And it has just been flawless. I just replaced it recently and it went to my bits box. And when I was doing this, I was like, you know what? So let's use this nice lightweight. I like the, uh, the length of that. That's what. Um, so anyways, um, with the rail kit there, they have these little panels and I'm assuming a couple of them. There's one I know that has a QD mount, which would be awesome. Um, but I basically just wanted to put these on there on the sides and then up front, um, just for this kind of grip, you know, and it works great. It feels great. This is the, uh, this is the... Sidewinder, um, and if I'm wrong, I will definitely go ahead and annotate that. Sidewinder from um, Night Strike Grips, and it feels amazing. I originally had it on one of my short guns, and to put it on a longer gun, I mean, it feels just unbelievable. You know, there's that little catch there, because I like to you know, burn my hand. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's it feels like it was designed for exactly where I have it and what I'm doing with it. So I like different kind of funky stuff. I like uh, different grips and things like that. Um, you know, when you first get the AFG from back in the day and it was crazy because you're used to using a vertical grip and then you're using the C-clamp, slit thumb, whatever, um, grip on the, the vertical grip. And then you go to an AFG or whatever and you're just like, holy cow, what is this? This doesn't feel right. It doesn't make sense to my hand. Um, and then after a while, they're you you get it you know then it's love um and this is sort of the same thing for the afg to something like this where you'll get it you'll move it around um it may not feel 100 percent right right away um they have definitely other ones that are more steep in an angle they have like multiple groove spots and those are those are awesome um those are also on the testing bench but this this group right here i think for me is is where the money's at so um, that's just attached with a simple piece of rail underneath and yeah, it's been rock solid since I mounted that on there So moving back. I don't think we forgot anything yet. <laughs> we'll see um, there is the strike industries ambush sling mount and I Like that an awful lot um, The reason why is you never know kind of what um, What you're gonna run into as far as a sling um, you know, what I do typically on my slings is I will keep uh, the QD cups um, on the sling itself, nothing on the gun. And then so whenever I attach my sling to a gun, I've already got the QD mounts to go ahead and, and click onto that. Um, there have been times when I've forgot those, lost them in my gun bag, they're attacked, but for whatever reason they're stuck to another gun. Um, having the little hook part to attach your sling to is is awesome i mean it's gonna be a little bit awkward because on this one it's on the other side but you know you never know what you're gonna run into if you have multiple guns with different sling setups uh, i have a good friend that all he runs is qds and he has one ar and so his sling is you know it's the magpul qd sling um without the hooks because 
he's only got one gun that he's running it on, and it's never going to change, and it always has the QD cups. For something like this, where I change out my guns quite a bit, or, you know, I'll make, like, loaners and trainers and stuff like that, having the ability to use what you have as far as the sling goes, regardless of what's on that sling, um, is really, really kind of cool. So, love the, uh, the mount. I mean, obviously, you can see how low profile that is. It is very, very, very well done. It really doesn't even come up over the the rails there and what's interesting too is when you look at this they actually had you screw in um, this little QD cup and that actually pulls the rail uh, or the sling together sling mount together so not only is this low profile but it's some pretty smart engineering they didn't have to do extra um, you know like screws on the side or whatever to bring it in so one of the things that strike is known for is making some really good engineering decisions um, and this is this is one of them so if you are looking for a sling mount and you don't know if you're going to do qd or like the mash hooks or whatever i i like it so it covers a lot of bases i would like to see one um if they could get it where they might have that bent down so it's closer to the rail as it is it's you know horizontal which again is perfectly adequate and you know they don't know what size rail you're going to put that on as far as outer diameter but having it bent down i think would be a um, a nice touch, make it a little bit less uh, wide on the gun. Because if you look at it also, it's pretty much the widest part of that upper receiver. So, but again, I mean, I think it's great. I think it works. It does everything that I need it to. Um, and it covers up for all my memory loss mistakes and uh, lost gear. So I can't complain too much about it at all. Um, so moving back from that, we have, uh, see the upper here. I think it's a palmetto upper, uh, blem upper, I'm not really sure. And it's covered in paint, so I don't really know. Um, but it's been on guns for years. Um, I swapped out my upper for a V7 upper receiver. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I had this sort of laying in the bin, so I was like, okay, let's just attach this, you know. Um, it works. And then, again, rear embus, just normal. Know, nothing too special on that they're not the embus pros um and that's just because for what you're paying for one site of the embus pros you can just get both embuses so um I, again i'm kind of a meat and potatoes guy i don't have a whole lot of money to necessarily fling around on things i may not be using a whole lot um so if it's just gonna be a folding site i really don't want to spend the extra money um but that's just me i mean everyone's mile mileage may vary and then what's interesting here is the um, the charger handle. So I have been a big fan of the DCM charging handles for a long time. And this one, so I usually use the uh, the Mod 4s. And this is the Mod 4 Bravo. And I'm torn on it. So normally the... Normally, um, you kind of have a more of a lever where this is almost like an extended uh, latch itself as opposed to like a lever sticking out of the main latch. Um, it looks a little bit cleaner. It looks less latchy, I guess. Um, but it feels weird because it's it's not what I'm used to. Um, I have um, the Mod 4s on almost all my guns. Um, there's a couple exceptions like the next level armament, uh, charging handle, center cord charging handle, things like that. But for the most part, uh, it's going to be a mod form. And so this just feels a little bit weird because it's not, you know, a piece sticking out. It's more of just a whole um, handle sort of hinged. Um, same great quality, you know, it's BCM. Um, my my mod fours were so old, they're the BCM Voltors. So yay me. Um, but, you know, it, this definitely feels great for what it is. Um, you know, no problems with that at all. Definitely able to use that effectively. Um, and not really had any problems with it. So there'll be a review. I'll put everything side by side and you guys can see kind of what we have as far as um, what the Mod 4 versus what the Mod 4 Bravo looks like. Um, so yeah, and then moving on here, there is a just a standard mil spec uh, six position buffer tube there with the Strike Industries uh, Viper stock on there. And I've had this for a while. Um, I love it. You know, I also love the uh, the MFTs. I think anything with a with a curved toe like that has been a really 
really nice for presentations, up drills, things like that. And uh, this one is no exception. Um, definitely the, um, the mechanics of it, the way that you can actually, um, you know, articulate it is really, really nice. It's very, very easy, um, you know, and um, you don't have to think about it. You know, some of these are like pushing buttons and pulling levers and unlocking. It's like, why? Um, so there's a little bit of rattle on here because this, I guess, is supposed to uh, go on commercial and um, little spec buffer tubes. I mean, there's rat there's rattle with the normal car stock. Um, this is nowhere near, I mean, it's a little bit there, but it's nowhere near what you're getting with just your standard M4 car stock. Um, you know, so if you can put up with that, you can definitely put up with this. Um, I will say, and I've done a review on that, you'll see that at our website, um, in the blog. Um, one of the things, though, about the uh, Strike Industries that I wish they had done differently is the rubber butt pad. And the rubber butt pad is something that you have to buy separately. Um, you know, whereas for like an MFT, that's included on the stock for the price. Uh, was it a whole lot? No. Was it a deal breaker? No. But when I got the stock home and it was very, very slippery because there's there's texture, but just not enough for like, you know, run on shirts and stuff. Um, I was pretty disappointed. You know, I called him up and said, hey, you know what? What, what gives? What are we uh, doing here? And they're just like, well, you know, we are coming out with a rubber butt pad. So a couple months later, they did have it. Um, I, I didn't buy it, you know, they didn't send it to me for review or anything. Um, once that's not been on there, um, it's been great. Um, you can see here, see the very, very bottom of the stock, there's one set screw. And I thought that would be a very poor mounting option, but there is a, like a lip in here that like, that'll dig into the stock and I've never had this thing come loose. And that's one of the things you'll notice about Strike is they have some amazing engineering and amazing engineering decisions. But when you look at it right away, it may not make much sense. Um, we'll be doing at some point a uh, video on my AK. And that has the Strike, you know, uh, M4 stock adapter. And I, I, I'm going to tell you, like, I looked at the videos and I looked at all the stuff that they were, you know, about the adapter and I was like this is never going to work this is not going to hold the stock on it's going to spin it's going to rotate it's going to fall off it actually works awesome you just have to see how it works kind of in person to understand the, the way that it does so um, definitely uh, good products but some of them take a little bit of uh, learning to get uh, get down so just a standard mill spec castle nut and end plate here and normally on all my guns there's a v7 uh, castle nut and end plate with a QD and because this gun was a budget gun, um, I don't have one of those. So um, my stock is really the uh, QD point back here. Um, and then of course there's the QD up front with the strike uh, ambush sling loop. So it's one of the few guns I have that I can't uh, just kind of like one point it or whatever right there, but I typically run a two point. So um, no big deal there. Uh, let's take a look here. So in the upper receiver or on it, we have another strike product. This is their ultimate dust cover. And these things are amazing, and I would hardly recommend that you buy them because, and hardly, um, when you put them in, there's actually a little notch with a spring that you can pop in and out and drop the piece right in. You just have to wind that little spring in the middle, um, and you're good to go. Now, having dealt with normal AR dust covers and popping those in and out, yeah, it's... Yeah, I, I hate it. I hate the C-clamp or the C-clip. I hate the rod. I hate the stupid spring that you have to wind up. It's not, it's not one of my favorite parts of building a gun. So having something that you can put on there um, for about 10 to 15 bucks and uh, and have that uh, good to go, I think is, is great. Saves time, saves frustration. Um, it's durable. I've been using them on a lot of guns. Um, looks great, feels great, is great. So. Absolutely. So underneath that, the bolt carrier group, we're not going to say a whole lot about this because I'll be honest, I don't know much about it. It was like a tactical something armory and whatever. And I just picked it up because it was on sale um, through primary arms. And I've got a bunch of bolt carriers, you know, just laying around the house, uh, bolts and stuff. 
Um, this was just something I wanted to kind of pick up for a view and to see what's going on with it. Obviously, it hasn't made that big of an impression because it's just sat in this gun, um, you know, mostly unfired. Um, so once we get some rounds on it, we'll be able to say some more about it. But as for right now, I mean, the staking was great. Um, everything was in its proper space. The cotter pin was insane to get out and even worse to get back in. Uh, it was extremely tight. That's what, anyways. Um, so it was, it was a pain. It sucked. Uh, but I was able to use an older kind of worn cotter pin from one of my other bulk carry groups. And that just slid right in there. But the fresh ones, all the anodizing, they did not want to go in. Um, yeah, that, <laughs> I don't know what else I can say. It was very, very frustrating uh, to try to put that back together. So we're moving down a little bit. And speaking of frustrating, the less I can say about the lower, the better. Um, this is a Great Lakes Firearms. And if you're following on Instagram or blog, you can definitely see our struggles with them and um, now I'm from Michigan and they are a local Michigan company and so when we were doing all the buying for stuff you know people were buying up lowers left and right Anderson's uh, Aero Precision's stuff like that and I had called a store that has you know in the past had a lot of good lowers and stuff in stock and they said you know hey we just sold our last uh, Aero Precision you know, but we had the Great Lakes Firearms. It was almost the same price, like 70 bucks. Kind of ridiculous, but whatever. Um, and so I said, okay, you know, just hold one, and I will be right down there. And now I've experienced some funky lowers before. Um, I don't know if you guys remember the Delaware machining lowers. Uh, if not, go ahead and look those up. Um, I was offered a couple of those at a, at a store five, six years ago. And, you know, I'm, I'm picking it up and I'm looking at all the holes and the fact that you can't see daylight, you know, through to the holes. Like, they're so far offset, you can't. And, um, you know, I remember telling the, the clerk, like, this is this is, this is is no good, this doesn't work. And they're like, oh, you know, this is fine. And we said, okay, well, let's take a spikes, you know, those, those, you know, great spec lower, sat down on top of it. And you're like, the holes aren't even drilled in the same spot. So they had to return all these things. So I don't even know if they're in business anymore. It's a, it's a hard mistake to come back from. Um, but um, yeah, so I've, I've seen it out with some eh, meh kind of lowers um, before. And this one is interesting in the fact that, I mean, if you see the lettering and stuff, it's very, very thick. It's very almost like it was done and then it was painted on. Um, same thing here. Um, you really can't even hardly read the serial number um so I, I i bought one and you know i brought it home and i'm putting it together and thankfully i did this before i got too far in the lower i rarely ever do this uh, but i put the pistol grip on kind of before doing a lot of other shit to it and the screw like cross threaded like i mean it was like the you know, when you uh, will move the screw up, the grip screw through the grip itself, um, and then, you know, have that lined up with the um, the screw pocket in the receiver, and go ahead and walk that screw in. It was just kitty wampus immediately from the, within the first turn, and I felt resistance, and I was like, oh God, backed it out, tried it again, and it kept doing it. So finally, I just took the grip off and tried to screw it on without the grip so I could see what angle was going in. And it's just like, if this is the whole kind of angle, it's going like that. Now, I built a lot of ARs and it's not bragging, whatever, it just it is what it is. Um, and I've never had that problem with any other ones. Um, I've had problems with the Anderson where they drill the screw pocket um, too short and you have to take a, um, like a belt sander and, and shorten the grip screw. Um, that's a known issue. People that build guns know that. You know, it's it's not a big deal as long as you've got the stuff for it. Um, this was an, another order of magnitude. This is just the whole thing is just foobar. You know, there's no there's no coming back from it. And then the screw had like just basically just locked up in the receiver, so it was at this funky angle, um, and just wasn't wasn't having it. So I contacted uh, guys from Great Lakes. I think it's Matt or Mike was one of the guys I talked to. And he says, hey, you know, bring it back up. Um, we'll take a look at it. It's about a half an hour, 45-minute drive. And I get there, and I don't know, like, 
they make some decent stuff. I don't want you to think I'm just here, you know, duking on them. But um, the the place was like a, um, a machine shop in the backyard of like some other company. Um, just really weird because the pictures online show that they have guns and everything's in the stock. Hey, it's cool. Um, in this case, it was just we we actually walked in and we thought like we were just walking into someone's like storage facility or whatever, and you know we saw the guns. We're like, okay, cool. And so they took a look at it and said, oh well, you know it's not it's 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 so stripped and cross threaded we can't even just tap it out. And I'm there's lowers all over the place. And I'm thinking to myself like I don't want a tapped out lower. Like I want like this isn't my issue. This isn't something that. Um, you know that uh, you know. I mean, this is this isn't something that I should uh, have to basically uh, come around and, and deal with when every other lower that I've ever built has never had this problem. Um, the other thing too is along the trigger guard, this little piece here, uh, sh extremely sharp. Um, so I'd, I'm gonna have to go file that down at some point just because it's it's pretty darn sharp. Um, and then the other thing here, in just a second, I'll see if I can take this down and show you at the end of the video the there's machining marks all the way through the magwell on the one that I had and it, like just you can see every pass of the machining I've never seen that before again with any lower or upper um so I finally gave it back to me uh, a new one and you, you know you'll say well you know if you just so you know you, you cross threaded it you should do this and I'm you know like I, I've built 30 40 guns you know something like that and I've not ever run into this problem you know if it's if it's, if it's operator error you know hey great but i've never had it where it's just stripped and it's just gone in at an, at an angle that i can't even go at you know um so he's like okay well you know here you go and it just kind of left um <laughs> we, we didn't really have much of an exchange after that i looked around at some of the parts and you know and, uh, he went back to machining something in the back and so we we're i guess done with that um so to clarify i mean delaware machine or um, Great Lakes Firearms did go ahead and give me what I needed. They got me a new lower receiver that did work. Um, you know, so I, I can't say anything bad because the, the, the outcome was what I wanted. I wanted a new one. I didn't want, you know, people were asking on Instagram, oh, can you tap it out? Like, no, that's not, that's not my problem at that point. Like, if, if it doesn't go in and the screw's at a 30 degree angle, tapping out's not going to matter and it's not my problem. I don't, um, anyways. And so, and so I installed it with a drill or anything. So, um, <laughs> moving on, we'll, we'll see about, uh, see if I can show you the uh, machine marks on the, uh, the mag wall here when we wrap this up here. So, um, the trigger guard here is a BCM uh, trigger guard and just a polymer one. And it is a decent substitution for the mag magpole one. Um, I know everybody and their brother makes polymer trigger guards. Um, the finishing is a little bit rough on this. You can, there's a little bit of like, you know, lining and stuff on there. But, you know, the Magpul Trigger Guard is about $9. You know, nothing breaks the bank. But this is about 6 So, you know, if you are building a gun on a budget like this is, um, look at the BCM Trigger Guards. They're BCM. They're great quality because that's who those guys are. And, uh, yeah, save a couple of bucks. I don't know. I'd never seen them before. Decided to buy one. Was happy with my decision. Um, moving back. There is a uh, Mo, or sorry, a K2 Plus. So that is the uh, short, or not short, but the, uh, the short angle, I guess, um, grip. So it's more of a vertical grip, um, more that you would kind of use on maybe like an SBR or a pistol. Now, one of the reasons that this is on there is I wanted to use the MFT grip that I had laying around the house. But it wouldn't go on like it just wouldn't like it wouldn't made up here like where all that you know the the grip of the receiver touch it wouldn't line up perfectly there it'd be like there's a small tiny hairline gap and that drove me nuts and so i put the k2 on there that was also laying around the house and i've been happy with it i, I didn't think i would because with the rubber texture on there i thought i'd be losing paint pretty quickly but um as any operator knows it's not the pattern, it's the wear. Uh, so, um, you know, maybe it looks so cool on the net. Um, but yeah, I mean, now that I've got that on there, no problems whatsoever. I do like the fact that it's a storage uh, grip. Not that there's a whole lot to store for this gun. Obviously the uh, lights, pretty much it. 
Um, yeah, so that's that. Uh, the upper has just a mil-spec parts kit, including the uh, Ford Assist there. So nothing special going on there. Regular brass deflector. And, um, yeah, bad lever. And a bad lever or some version of it is on every one of my guns. And I love them. And I would never want to run a gun without them. Um, doing it just doesn't feel natural. It's, it feels like the way that the gun was meant to be. Uh, I said, well, I know people have different opinions on them and, and whatnot. Um, and sure, that's, that's fine. You know, if you've had one or you've seen one fail or somebody misuse it, that's a great data point for not having one of those on your gun. You know, I've got like six guns, something like that, and all of them have either bad lever or the Phase 5. Uh, I really like the Phase 5 because it is all one piece. So nice and, nice and easy to do. But um, yeah, so that's on there. That makes me happy. And, uh, yeah, let's go ahead and take a look inside real quick, and uh, we'll wrap this up here. Now, we're running kind of long, but uh, let's take a look here. So, go ahead and check that magazine. And what we'll do here course we're doing it live so the lower is an Anderson lower parts kit and one of the things I like from Anderson is their trigger uh, if you can see that little trigger there is nice and shiny um, same thing with the internal parts and the hammer has a different geometry than a normal AR hammer would have and for a person who rarely has mil spec triggers anywhere near their guns, um, I like Hyperfire, I like um, ALG, you know, um, things like that. Having a stock mil spec trigger sucks. And it's gritty and ratchety and crappy and, and I don't like it. This is a very um, stiff trigger and that's not necessarily a problem. I mean, again, if you're using things like Hyperfires, ALGs, Geisleys, whatever, you're going to get spoiled by having, you know, a trigger that just breaks when you think about it. In this case, there is, it's, it's a much, um, much more forceful pull, probably around like five pounds. If, if Grand Thumb was here, he would be able to tell me just by fingering it. But, <laughs> as I am a pleb, um, so you can see here, like there's no movement in that at all, like none. And this is, this is on fire. So if you are comfortable with a stiff trigger and you don't mind that, you know, it's, it's a great trigger. I was kind of taken aback by it just because I'd never had a trigger that has like zero movement and then such a heavy break. Um, but you know, as opposed to a standard mill spec trigger, I'll take it. You know, the parts kit didn't cost any more because of it. Um, Anderson stuff is good to go. I don't know so much about the RF85 stuff where it never needs to be lubed. Um, having worked with machines for a good chunk of my life, I can tell you that everything needs to be lubed. Everything needs to break down or, or they will break down at some point. Um, so guys, make sure that you keep your guns lubed. Um, as opposed to listening to manufacturers, make sure it makes sense. Um, but uh, let's take a look here and see if we can, I don't know if you can see that. Uh, maybe not. Okay. Well, maybe. Either way, they have, there's some pictures on our, our blog about that, but there's a uh, chatter, like, like machine marks all the way up the inside of this. And I've had some of my machinist friends look at that and they're just like, okay. But again, it works as far as I know. Um, you know, again, they did do what they were supposed to do, um, you know, and, and get me a, another lower. So, I mean, I can't complain too much. So if I do this without blowing my hand off or, you know, breaking a nail.
This will let the video go, I don't know, like 40 minutes. Um, so one thing I wanted to uh, point out is, if this will go apart, there it goes. Uh, this is just the Expo Arms ooh, um, buffer spring there. So just a standard bill spec carbine. Um, looks like every other spring you've probably ever handled. Um, doesn't, you know, the coil cutting is not ground down. It's, you know, a sharp edge. Keep it away from children. So you can see that, you know, they just, you know, rolled these things off, a, you know, on a machine and did them as, as quick and as cheap as possible. But I'm all about quick and cheap. That's my life. Um, so the last thing here is the Expo Arms buffer. And I think, uh, so we'll see. And it looks pretty interesting. Uh, when I bought it, I was like, okay, cool. Like a bread buffer that kind of lets me know, hey, this is, you know, the, the buffer for this gun, whatever. And you get your same wobbly, wobbly, nice, tiny, whiny weights in there. But it is covered in like a phosphate coating. So if you look at that, it's, I don't know what to make of it because normal buffer weights are slick. You know, they're designed to go and move inside that spring without any friction. Where this, I mean, well, you hear that, um, there is phosphate friction. You know, it's just the way that that coating is. So we'll have to see. Um, you know, I've had, um, I had two buffers actually break and crack. I don't know how that happens. Um, I had one buffer that went out in the class, and that one was my fault for screwing with it. Um, the roll pin had come out. And again, that is 100% my fault. So, um, yeah, so we'll see. I mean, we'll, we'll shoot it a lot and see what um, we'll shake some bakes on that. Um, I'm hoping that it is okay. I mean, it's much cheaper than the rest of the buffers and stuff out there, but Expo Arms is kind of known for. Uh, the cheap stuff, so we'll see. So, and lastly, so this is the tactical something I don't know. Um, <laughs> but if you look at the staking, the staking is actually pretty good for like an $80 bolt carrier. Um, it is nitride finished, um, nice and slick. The operation looks pretty good. I took it apart when I got it, and everything is in there. The bolt, I'll show you this real quick. Uh, no, I won't actually, because this thing is such a pain. The bolt tape for me, and you probably see it here, is magnetic particle inspected. Um, so that's kind of cool. You know, on, a, on such a cheap carrier, I don't know. They could have said, hey, we inspected it. It was crap, and I threw it back in the, the go pile. I don't know. We'll see. But the machining looks good. The, you know, again, the cotter pin is the devil to take out. So that's, that's the problem there. But uh, yeah, I mean, I've, I stripped it down as soon as I got it. Firing pin looks good. I mean, everything looks good in middle spec. So um, I can't say much about it other than you'll see. Um, we do see there on the locking lugs, uh, there's already some wear in the coating uh, for basically dry firing. From from so I think the gun dry as as I said with the uh, um, epidemic right now we are not really <laughs> we're not going out a whole lot to uh, to do some shooting so um, yeah anyways that is pretty much it um, you know I always like to see these build series from people because there are people that will put things together in a way that I never thought of or you know. They'll do something and it's like, oh gosh, I had no idea that that would work that way or you could do X, Y, Z. And like I said, again, you know, before with, you know, I ran RFCOM or whatever else and, you know, it's like, oh, you know, I don't know how, you know, my metal magazine with a, a green follower. We're not doing that anymore, guys. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop complaining. But anyways... Thank you for watching. If you watched through the whole thing, uh, it's probably one of the longest videos I've done. Um, so <laughs> if you're if you're still watching, thank you so much. Definitely go ahead and check out our blog. Everything will be on the uh, the annotations, the pinned comment uh, below there. But uh, check out our blog. There's discounts on the KCT um, syndicate page, and you can use that for other great companies. We're always adding more. So if you're a company and you like what you see here, you always be better. <laughs> um, but 
we would be more than happy to do some affiliate stuff for you guys. Test out products. Um, yeah, definitely love it. So any questions that you have, um, I know that people will come out and you know, ask questions of what I didn't think of, you know, when we did this. Um, so yeah, feel free to ask away. I'm going to stop talking. Guys, thank you so much for bearing with me here and uh, checking out this rifle today. Hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day. And until we see you next time, stay accurate.